Hello and welcome back to the Enjurati studio. I'm now uh, joined by Namesh Patel, who's the uh, CEO of Gridco Systems. And firstly, welcome, welcome to Thanks the studio. Thanks very much. Thanks yeah, for having uh, me. Yeah. And uh, we were talking a little bit off air about, um, and I was mentioning some of the comments that have been made about distributed generation. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I feel is lacking is some sort of clarity about two things. One, the impact it's going to have to the utility. Mm -hmm. And where we're going with the business model. So right. let's not try and do two questions in one. Mm -hmm. If you could just expand a little bit about where you see the impact of it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so, so fundamentally the impact, there's two really, really two impacts. First is a technical impact, which is really about reliability and capacity of the system, the distribution system in particular. And the second is what's the revenue model impact to the utility. So let's talk about both of them. Mm -hmm. So the first is generally the leading indicator of the impact of distributed generation is voltage, very simply. Uh, generally what happens is, upon upstream power flow, voltages rise, and, uh, and in addition to that, they rise in a somewhat unpredictable manner, because as clouds move over the solar panels, you get a time varying output. And of course, utilities, distribution utilities, have to manage voltage within uh, predetermined standards. And so to the extent that the distributed generation is causing violation of those standards, utilities need to be able to regulate the voltage, right? And the challenge for, uh, for distribution utilities now is that the traditional tools that they've used to manage voltage, which are generally electromechanical pieces of equipment, whether voltage regulators or capacitor banks, are not able to either observe or keep up with the changes that the distributed generation are causing. So generally, they're ineffective in either solving it, and even if they were effective in solving it, the more they actuate, the more they wear out. So there's a fundamental reliability issue. So to address this sort of leading problem, uh, really what's needed is uh, devices that sit on the secondaries of the distribution system that are able to observe and react in real time uh, to voltage changes and assure compliance within the standards. But what that requires is devices that don't require any moving parts uh, because moving parts right. tend to wear out. Right? Right. And that's the opportunity for a new class of infrastructure that we term active grid infrastructure uh, that regulates voltage on a continuous sub-cycle uh, and multifunctional way but that also lasts 25 years plus. So that's the sort of technical impact. Um, at high, even higher penetration rates, uh, you actually see the need for the distribution utility for really the first time in history to actively manage supply and demand. You know, traditionally, it's demand, it's gone, only been demand, it's right? It's only been demand, it's Correct. flowed one way. That's right, yeah. so now they have to actually balance supply and demand, particularly when there's excess generation. And you know, in countries like Germany and Europe, the, the excess generation gives rise to negative prices in the wholesale generation market, the wholesale market, for example. So that leads actually into the, some of the economic issues. Uh, you know, fundamentally, the distribution utility's revenue is really a function of how many kilowatt hours they sell. That's, that's how the revenue model has been yeah. set up and regulated. But if you look at where their costs are, increasingly the costs are actually in the capacity that they have to invest in, in the system, to be able to accommodate both load and supply. Because they're getting into a world that's more and more complex, so you need to more uh, different, newer grid upgrades to deal with all of this. So, that's correct. So their operating costs are going up. That's right. But in, their income is going down. Correct, and particularly yeah. their capital, in, the capital costs are actually going up, right? Yeah. Generally speaking, for the distribution utility, their capital costs scale as the peak demands on the system that they have to accommodate. But the revenues, as you just said, scale with the volumetric sales. And so you're getting this growing disparity between costs and revenue. Yeah. And so fundamentally, what's required now is also, in conjunction with the technical solutions to manage reliability, a change to the revenue model of the utility to better align those costs and the sources of revenue. And that likely uh, involves repricing, or at least changing the design of the rate structure that customers pay into the system. And instead of having just a volumetric charge and perhaps a capacity charge, there's likely to be a need for even a fixed charge, which is which, sort of like an access fee. And that compensates the grid investment Correct. and the things That's like that. That's right, okay. required to accommodate. Right. Now, technically all of this is possible, right? But, but I underscore the need for the regulatory change because without those economic incentives, it's going to be quite difficult to address this problem at scale. Yeah, because there's a, there's a whole thing about um, the market right. being kind of fundamentally not up to speed with where generation is going to come from mm -hmm. and 
you know, the renewables are following a technology curve, not, not a fuel price curve mm -hmm. in terms of their costs to generate. Right. Um, and, you know, how does the market need to, need to adjust to integrate all of this stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the commentators that I was talking said, actually, we need different types of pricing mm -hmm. because we need to reward um, quick to ramp mm -hmm. power source right. differently from a very slow to ramp base load type Indeed. Their tank. Indeed. Well, much like we see in the wholesale markets in the transmission, mm -hmm. some of those concepts now need to be actually implemented in distribution. So for example, there's the capacity markets that are everyone well knows in mm -hmm. transmission. Uh, those now will become important in distribution because capacity price signals are the means of signaling to investors either in supply or in locating demand, mm -hmm. such as large uh, IT loads, for example. Um, so that they can actually build the business model themselves on what the value of that location is for either PV or load. So those capacity signals are generally long term uh, and don't change that often. In fact, you don't want them to change that often because it takes some time for the, for the market to adapt to those. Yep. There's also a need for a short term market on the energy itself, not on the capacity but the energy, the kilowatt hours. And this is actually one of the things you're referring to. And once you have deployed capacity, whether that's solar or wind or whatever it may be, the actual day-to-day -day utilization of that capacity has to be driven by these more dynamic energy markets, right? And of course, these things are not just a function of time, but also location, because uh, there shouldn't be an artificial incentive to invest, uh, for a customer, for example, to invest in, in photovoltaic supply if there isn't local demand, right? Then you know there's going to be excess, and that will impact your transmission system. So. The pricing scheme needs to be two-tiered, capacity and energy, and as a function of time and space or location. Mm -hmm. That's quite different from today. If you look at net energy meeting today, it's a fixed price. It can have a schedule over time, but never lets a fixed price. And it totally ignores the fact that there's actually fluctuations in demand. Uh, and any, it doesn't take a PhD in ec yeah. economics to realize that you need both to understand supply and demand to be able to set price. And, and so, Sounds like a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, right? Where you need the regulators to make a move, but and we were talking a little bit off air about what what part of the technology play do you think is actually going to force regulators to make the move? Because you know there'll come a point, which is uh, a comment you made, is that it's not whether if, when, how, or where, but distribution generation is going to happen. Right. You know, so. You know, why, are, why is there such a slow reaction, it seems like anyway, to deal with it? Well, I think f fundamentally there's inertia in the system, cultural inertia. I mean, you know, the distribution system is operated largely the same way and by the same rules for quite some time. And generally speaking, it's actually worked quite well. And so if you look at either the investors behind the distribution system operators or even if they're government owned, the resistance to change is high, right? And, the, and, and at the technical level, the resistance, to, the resistance to change from utilizing business as usual approaches is also high, right? But fundamentally, what's going to drive this is economics. I mean, I think we're seeing that in multiple countries here in, in Europe, where the revenue model impact is significant. And at the end of the day, that has an impact on the reliability of power delivery to all of us, mm. right? And so I think really what will drive it is where there is occurring reliability impacts and as a result, investments need to be made. That's what will instigate, ultimately, the regulatory changes that need to be made. So it almost to needs to get to a point where people are seeing unreliability before. It seems somewhat counterintuitive for a, for, a, uh, 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 for a business and an industry that prides itself on you know, being resilient for the future and stuff I like think, that. I think you're quite right. It, yeah. is, it is actually counterintuitive. Yeah. But, but, and I hope, actually, that uh, as an ecosystem, we can actually get ahead of that curve so that we don't hit a crisis point that forces change, but rather adopt and architect the change before we hit that point. And in fact, you know, the longer we wait, the more difficult it's going to be because the political tensions in the system will be higher the longer we wait and make it more difficult to because, enact those yeah, changes. Yeah, because you can never ab ab abstract politics from the... But, Indeed. But you, but, you, but, but you hit a, uh, you know, something quite salient, but it's like, this is, needs an engineering solution. And when you deploy an engineering solution rapidly and quick time, 
that has a high risk attached to it because you're making decisions not in a thought out, planned out way, but you're just reacting. That's right. You don't want to be in reactive mode, yeah, right? You yeah. want to be proactively architecting a system that by design will work, right? Um, and of course, you know, that's natural because the, at the end of the day, distribution utilities goals are safe, reliable, and cost-effective delivery of power. We can't ignore safe and reliable, right? And so whatever the new technical architecture and economic architecture is, it's got to be well done. That does take some time. So uh, just as we're coming to the end of our time here, well, what do you think is going to be the single biggest tipping point within distributed generation? I mean, I'm, I'm asking a number of commentators on, on this oh, thing, and it'll be interesting to hear what your perspective is on that. Well, so you're asking about tipping point for oh. growth of the generation uh, or the impact uh, of generation? You know, on? Growth of distributed generation. Oh. The, that, you know, we're going to see a higher adoption uh, or, 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 or some sort of change that actually it, it just becomes the norm. Yeah. Right, so I think the economics behind distributed generation are already very strong in multiple geographies. Subsidy independent, by the way. And so from that perspective, it's likely to continue. The, the question in my mind is, how large a system will customers ultimately deploy based on the fact that there will be limitations on the distribution system's capacity to absorb it and therefore for the customers to monetize it? And I think that we're seeing in multiple geographies that certain uh, regulators are actually pushing, pulling back now on right. the incentives, anticipating that point. Now, of course, these things can be solved technically, uh, but nevertheless, we're in a little bit more of a reactive mode at the current time. And if we step back a second and look at the system as a real system and design, again, both the economic and the technical solution, to address it, then I think we'll find an equilibrium where you can have very high penetration of distributed generation, and it doesn't impact the reliability of the system. Because you're getting to uh, to a technology layer which is balancing everything right. out. And, and this is just an observation to me, because it seems to me that in a weird way, the bigger you make the distributed generation system, mm -hmm. the more stable it is. You get law of large numbers yes. on, your, on your side. Yeah. That's right, yeah. that's right. Uh, but, but remember that also that the total capacity of generation um, does matter. In other words, as the percentage of distributed generation, as a ratio of the total capacity increases, then there's more need for this dynamic supply-demand balance. You're it, right that the problem becomes in some ways easier, uh, but you're also dealing with the problem at scale at that point. Is there some sort of optimal size? Uh, or is that that's just hard to that's answer? That's hard to yeah, answer, because right. it's geographically dependent, it's economically right. dependent, it's politically dependent. Um, but, but I think the point is, it is possible to architect a system that's adaptable to whatever size is required. Well, that's brilliant. And, and on that note, we'll leave it as we come to the end of our time here. Thank you uh, as well for watching uh, many more of these uh, uh, interviews. And uh, we may connect with you a little bit off air to put some flesh onto this. So if you're watching this on Engirati, we may have uh, written a bit more detail underneath the uh, video as well to expand on the points. So thank, thank you for much. watching. Thanks. Thanks.